Our hymn of celebration this morning is hymn number 613. Would you please stand as you are able and join us in singing. Please remain standing as we unite in the historic confession of the Christian Church. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, 
suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, and he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. seated. Would you join me as we prepare our hearts together for prayer? Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you, kind Father, for the ability and the, the um, freedom that we have to gather together, to worship you. And God, when we come together, we not only encourage each other, we do receive from you this, this reminder of who we are and whose we are. Our, our spirit is rekindled. Our love, uh, the, that you, the love that you have for us is once again defined. And, and our cup overflows when our heart is open. Lord, we're human. And being human, oh God, and in the, in the midst of humanity, we, we know, oh God, there are some things that are just vying for our attention battling for control. It comes from so many different places. And we have feelings, oh God, that go along with those battles. Feelings that draw us to you in prayer. Feelings, oh God, of frustration. Feelings, oh God, with we wonder and Maybe if you are with us in those moments. But coming together today, we acknowledge our human emotion. Because if we do deny that, we rob ourselves of what it means to be human. But at the same time, oh God, if we let that be our only voice, and if we do not let the voice of your spirit speak to us, then we rob ourselves of your healing perspective in our lives. And so, God, we come celebrating even that even though we only judge things by appearance, you, O oh God, judge things by consequence. We celebrate, O oh God, your presence. We reaffirm our commitments and our hearts' missions. We surrender those things that we have held on to. Those things that we demand in prayer and those other things that we just, well, hold in our heart and not even mention. And we resolve, O oh God, to let you do what you do best. For it is, O oh God, your kingdom. It is, O oh God, for your glory. It is, O oh God, your name that is renowned. And it's your will that we desire to be present here on earth. 
as we're reminded by those words, as we pray together the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Let us now worship God with his tithes and our offerings. Let us pray. Receive these, O God, your tithes and our offerings and allow them to be multiplied within this church so that we may be able to further your kingdom and to hasten, to your, hasten your return. It's all for your glory and your honor. Amen.
Would you please remain standing as we read from Matthew chapter 6. Beware of practicing your piety before others in order to be seen by them. For then you have no reward from your Father in heaven. So whenever you give alms, do not sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues or in the streets. So that they may be praised by others truly. I tell you, they have received their reward. But when you give, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. So that your alms may be done in secret and your father who sees in secret will reward you. And whenever you pray, do not be like the hypocrites. For they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corner so that they may be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward. But whenever you pray, go, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your father who is in secret. And your father who sees in secret will reward you. When you are praying, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do. For they think that they will be heard just because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need, even before you ask. Pray then this way. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts, as we have also forgiven our debtors. And do not bring us to the time of trial, but rescue us from the evil one. For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others, neither will your Father forgive you your trespasses. And whenever you fast, do not look dismal like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces so as to show others that they are fasting. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward. But when you fast, put oil on your head and wash your face, so that your fasting may be seen not by others, but by your Father, who is in secret, and your Father, who sees in secret, will reward you. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks May the peace of Christ be with you. Also with you. I welcome you once again, members and visitors. We're so very glad that you're here with us. There is a red pew pad at the center aisle. Please take a moment to pass those down and pass them back, registering your attendance with us and learning the names of those who are worshiping around you. And as you welcome and greet each other's each other, I welcome the children to come down for our children's sermon. Yeah. Hey, guys. How y'all doing? Uh, welcome. I'm going to show you some stuff. No, that's not school. This is all the way over in Israel. So, like, if this is us right here in the United States, Israel is all the way across the world. So, did y'all have opening day yesterday? Yeah. Yeah. You did. All right. A grand slam. It's like fantastic. Well, it's been a while since I've seen you guys. It's been a couple of weeks. And, yeah, I know it. It's been a while. And I want to show you some place, a place that we traveled to a couple of weeks ago. Uh, yeah, I know it. Where do you, Why do you have a magazine? Well, I do. It's a magazine of the Holy Land. Yeah, I know it. Well, it's okay. We all can ask it. And this is a place that's a church that's called the Church of the Beatitudes. You know, part of what Mr. John read a while ago in the scripture reading was something that was called from the Sermon on the Mount. So you see this? See that? You can't see that? How about here? Can you see, can you see it now? All right, okay. Well, look at this. Doesn't this picture look real similar? What? Yeah. That's right. <laughs> Not so loud. Not so loud. Not so loud. Yeah. Yeah, we, listen, we were there. Listen, your, your grandmother and grandfather were there. Look, there's another picture. Yeah, there's another picture of it. Look at this one. And uh, there's, well, that's, uh, that's me. I guess what I'm reading. I'm, I'm reading the, I, I am reading the Bible. I'm reading the same thing that Mr. John read. 
And here, here's another one. Yeah. Look, you see that one? Yeah. You don't see it? I need a bigger phone, don't I? You don't see it? All right. So there's Mr. John reading, right? And this is where I'm reading now. You can't see it? Okay. All right. <laughs> okay. All right, hang on. Hang on. I know it. Right, there's all of us. Look. There's all of us. Where? Right here. Where? We had 52 people. Can you believe that? 52 Where? people. Right here. This is us. Where? <laughs> Just take my word for it. <laughs> yeah. So, hang on. This is, this is called the Church of the Beatitudes. And Jesus preached this sermon on the same place. And you know what he didn't have? You know what he didn't have? What for? A microphone. I know it. Can you imagine that? Yeah. Well, he didn't yell because that wouldn't be good. It, uh, but, all right, all right, so here I want you to do something with me, okay? Quietly, quietly, I want you to say, <laughs> that's not quiet. <laughs> well, obviously, Jesus did not do that. But he was, he was able to speak, and he was kind of up high. And the way the ground and the land is set up, even though he might be talking like this, it sounded like he was talking like that. And the wind was behind him, and as he would say, blessed are, the wind would take his words all over to all the people who were listening. At that place where that church now sits. And that's called the Church of the Beatitudes, all right? So whenever Miss Donna or maybe somebody's reading in Matthew's Gospel, oh, yeah, I know it's, it's a book in the, in the New Testament, particularly around the Beatitudes, I want you to remember this picture. Can you do that? Look, remember what picture? This picture. I don't see it. <laughs> you see it. I don't see it. I'll see it. You see it. You see it, don't you? See this church? Well, it is a blue sky, but there's a church under it. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'll tell you what. I'm going to pray for illumination so that you all can see. All right? But in order to do that, you've got to bow your heads. Can you do that with me? All right, let's bow our heads. Close our eyes. You ready? You ready? Oh, God, we give thanks for your love and your mercy, and we give thanks that uh, you speak to us, and for that we are grateful. What I hope and pray, as, as with everyone else in here, that as these who sit with me, as they grow in every way imaginable, that they hear your voice, not only guiding and directing, but they hear your voice, a voice of love, a voice of encouragement, and ultimately a voice of salvation. Watch over them, we pray, and we pray this in the name of Christ. Amen. While we're transitioning, do want to say a word of uh, thanks to, to you for your uh, thoughts and prayers uh, for me and for some of the others that, uh, upon returning from our trip, um, brought back the wonderful gift of the flu. And uh, I had the flu probably 20 years ago, still not a fan of it, and uh, highly uh, don't recommend it, that's for sure. Uh, and then also a word of thanks to our staff. Um, I, I remember my first appointment years ago getting a call on a Saturday afternoon, roughly around 4.30, 5 o'clock, from at that time the senior minister, uh, and it was a church about the size of St. Paul, and his words uh, to me were, I'm sick, you've got it. And uh, so I thought, well, that was just not fair, and, uh, you know, to, to, be, to, to have to go on such short notice as, uh, you know, as an associate. Uh, until last Saturday, when sitting in the doctor's office, uh, called John and said, hey, guess what? I'm sick. You got it. <laughs> so, but uh, between John and Grace and Wayne and, and all the other staff members, uh, definitely indebted to what they do and how they do it, uh, e even on the fly, and I'm grateful for them. Will you join me in prayer? Oh, God, as we uh, worship and... In the, 
in the aftermath of a scripture reading and an anthem, uh, if it, we know that words never die. And if there's a way that uh, all that is used and leveraged through your spirit so that what's created is the gospel inside of us, your kingdom, uh, we pray for that again. Not that you need our acceptance, uh, Lord, but we do uh, yield our hearts and our minds this morning uh, to, to, that, to that endeavor. Uh, so take this time, all of this service, uh, use it in a way that not only lifts up your name, but moves our nature, even if it is to the smallest of degrees, uh, to the nature of Christ. Uh, we pray that in your name. Amen. The Sermon on the Mount is part of the text that John read is the Sermon on the Mount. The, the sermon itself, Matthew 5 through Matthew 7, um, can be divided into a number of different segments. The first segment is one that most of us know. It's that most poetic piece, the Beatitudes, blessed are this, blessed are that. And, and, and then right after that is another small segment that is, if the Beatitudes describe the character of a Christian... Then the next segment gives analogies of what it's like to live that way in the world. And we have that part where the image of being salt, the image of being light, the, the idea is you live a certain way and that style of life is infectious to the world that is around you. And then the third segment is a, a very lengthy piece uh, at the end of chapter 5 uh, and, and part of chapter 6 to where Jesus spends a great deal of time uh, describing that that style of life is not in conflict with the law, that actually that style of life is a deeper dive into the law uh, of what was written in the Old Testament. Now today, it's another segment. And today's passage uh, has to do with what is it like for us to live this style of life uh, inside of what others might call religious activity. We could use different language. What is it like to live out your faith, uh, particularly when it comes to disciplines? Now, the context, the context of the passage is in, incredibly Jewish. Now, Jesus is, is talking uh, to a number of people who, who all understood the Old Testament uh, in that day. And, and so the context is the three major disciplines in Judaism. And that is giving, praying, and fasting. Giving is how you treat other people. Praying is how you treat God. Fasting is how you treat yourself. And so that's the context of the lesson this morning, or at least the portion of the Sermon on the Mount that we're looking at for today's Scripture. Now what is assumed is not that the original hearers, and for us as well, the assumption does not change, that the audience, the assumption is not if the audience will participate in these disciplines. That's not a question that, that is asked of the text. The assumption is people will participate in a disciplined life as they live out their, their faith. And, and in these three major tenets, it's not if we will give, pray, and fast, it's when we give, pray, and fast. That's the context for the lesson this morning. So the first one is this idea of giving. How do you treat other people? Now, in the ancient world, particularly in the days of Jesus, they, when it comes to giving, we're used to giving a certain way. We either, during the offering, uh, during the service, we pass an off offertory plates or some level of a bag or a plate or what have you, or people give online or, wh or whatever it may be. There was none of that in Jesus' day. Actually, if you can imagine uh, if this was the temple, about uh, from the middle uh, of the sanctuary back to the back, say to, to the narthex, if you can imagine these, dip, these different trumpets that are turned up on their heads, maybe six or eight of them along the sides of the sanctuary, you'd get an idea of what it was like in Jesus' day. And each trumpet was designed according to whatever level of of, of money that a person was giving. They didn't have paper money the way, the way we do. Their money was tied to either something very small like the widow's mite uh, on up to things of gold or silver. And depending on what, what, 
gift you were giving at that time, you would find the, the appropriate trumpet, and then you would drop your coin into the trumpet, the large part of the trumpet, and it would funnel its way down to the mouth part of the trumpet, and then it would make a sound as the money went into the temple treasury. So get a picture of that. And so people on their way into the temple, they would just walk in, find the appropriate trumpet, drop it in, and bing, it would make a sound depending on whatever level of gift that a person was giving at whatever particular time in their life. Even if people were not watching, they would know what gift was given by the sound. So that gives you some insight into why Jesus said, when you give, don't don't worry about the sound. Better yet, when it comes to giving, again, the issue is not if I will give, but when I give. That's the assumption in the text. Do I give for immediate applause or recognition? Because therein lies the temptation for the people in Jesus' day and the temptation for us. What is the motive behind what you do? Do we give so that it will give a certain level of sound to which everybody knows what we're doing? And it, it would be like if, if you go to a play and, and the actors, they perform, and at the end of the play, they pull the curtain back, and then each actor comes out, and immediately the audience applauds what they did. Is that why we give? Is that what what giving is about, for us to immediately get our applause? Or do we give because it's a means that teach us to be generous as character or because what we really want to do is help another person? Keep in mind, in, 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 in Jewish understanding of discipline, giving, one of the major tenets of, of disciplines, is how you treat another person. Do we give with, uh, well, the way Jesus, he gives further commentary that says, don't let one hand know what the other hand is. That has everything to do with control. Do we give so that we can control? Maybe what we get in return, applause, recognition? Or do we simply give because that's a part of who we are as followers of Christ, and we give because we want to be generous people. Now, Jesus never critiqued what level of gift a person is giving. So you can't can't draw that conclusion. The issue in the text is what are the motives behind? So maybe another question would be for us in our life would be, would you still give if you didn't get a tax deduction? Would you give just because you want to be generous in how you treat another person? And the discipline of giving is a means by which we help other people. Some of you are involved with with ministries like Habitat for Humanity. Love, Love that. You know why? Because people give of their time and their money and they create something And as as wonderful as that is, what I really like is what happens after that. Then they give it away without the strings. One of my best friends who's a minister out in Houston, long before he was appointed to the church that that he's at uh, today, is about 20 years, 20 years ago, the church... It's a very wealthy church in a wealthy uh, neighborhood and, and zip code of Houston, Texas. And they realized that a community not far from them, geographically speaking, what was struggling. And it's after a time of prayer, they said, you know, if there's anybody that's going to make a difference, it's going to have to be us. So they went through this major campaign, raised millions of dollars to build, if you took our Mercy Med, our Boys Club and Girls Club, Open Door Community House, and Rose Hill Ministry, and you, if you put that all together in one place, that's what they created. And the idea was first, well, what do we do? Do we put our name on it? Do we say this is the ministry of our church? And they went through a period of a discernment and said, no, we don't think that's appropriate. And then they said, well, okay, we won't put our name on it, but obviously it's got to have a controlling board because it's, such, it's, it's, it's millions of dollars and it's got a huge impact inside this community. And so what we'll do is we'll, we'll, we'll have the majority on the board. 
And they went through a discernment and said, no, that's not it either. Said that this is something that we do because it's tied to being a follower of Christ. So if you go to Spring Branch today in Houston, Texas, 51% of the advisory board that runs that ministry is from the neighborhood. 49% is from the congregation that raised the money and built it. They have one requirement to serve. You know what it is? You have to mention the name of Jesus Christ at one point to the children who come into contact with that ministry every single day. What Jesus is asking his audience and what he asks of us is what are the motives behind why you give? The assumption is not will you, it's, it's assumed you will. It's just why. Is it for immediate applause, recognition? Or is it because it's a means, a discipline that teaches us to be more in line like the nature of Christ? It's not about the gift. It's about the motive. He goes on. He says prayer. Now prayer, if giving is how you treat another person, then prayer is how do you treat God? The, the, the commentary on this particular part of the Sermon on the Mount, this is not a call to not pray in public. I had someone tell me one time, that said, well, I really don't pray out loud in public. And I said, well, why? I'm just curious. I said, well, you know, Jesus said, don't do that. You've got to pray in secret. That's not what this text is about. Inside of Judaism, there are public prayers by individual. There are public prayers by the community. There are private prayers by an individual, and there are private prayers by a community. This is not about whether or not we should speak out loud when we pray. The issue, then, is the motive, just like with giving. When you pray... If everybody heard every single word that you prayed, would that make a difference? I mean, I pray out loud all the time. Every Sunday, every Wednesday, every Tuesday, every Friday. Do you pray so that someone could say, boy, that Shane, man, he sure is spiritual. Look at all those words, the way, look how long it is. Or is prayer how we treat God? When, when Brooke and I were married, uh, we, we, uh, we were in, I was in seminary, and, and we were married, and we stayed here for a, a number of months. Uh, to, if you could prepare yourself for being married in about 10 months, we had this bright idea that we would learn what we needed to know here in Columbus, and then we would move back to Columbus, I mean, uh, to, to Kentucky, and, and we would have it all. We, we didn't know anything. <laughs> and uh, we lived in what is called married housing. Now, to get a sort of a, a view of this, if you could imagine a, a duplex being built back in the 1950s. Now, we were married in the 1990s. We had 600 square feet on our side of the duplex, and then the neighbors had 600 uh, square feet on their side uh, of the duplex, separated by a thin, thin wall. You could hear everything. We could hear the conversations they had for dinner. We could hear their TV. We could hear any and everything that would go on inside of a house. We could hear them. They could hear us. Do you think, knowing that, that you would act differently? I can tell you we did. It's hard to have private, honest conversations when your neighbor can hear every single word. If words can create intimacy, it's hard to have intimacy via words when everybody else can hear what you're saying. So when you pray, which is the means by which one is intimate with God with words, 
act as if nobody can hear. That's the lesson. Because in a situation like that, you're more inclined to be honest. And there is not intimacy in relationships, even relationship with God, if you cannot be honest. So when you pray, act as if you are in a closet where the only person who can hear the words are God. Not as if everybody else can hear so that then they would walk away and say, man, that boy's spiritual. Look how good he is. Fasting, in, in, its, uh, in its origin, this discipline wasn't necessarily tied to food. The idea is that there's a time of anguish, there's a time of, of growth, there's a time of reflection of something right in front of you that then everything else that's, uh, that's out beyond that does not matter, at least at that particular moment. In this time of whatever's before you, the desire is to devote your energy, devote your thinking, devote your time to that so that out of that becomes something that is close. And then there'll be time for something else. It's a discipline of learning to say no to self. Self-denial. Now contrast that in our day and time where... We live for instant gratification. How many of you have, uh, you don't necessarily do it during the service, okay, but, uh, or, but get out your phone, send a text to your friend, and you're still looking at the phone, and the text changes from green to blue, which means they've received it, right? That's what happens when the color changes. And you're looking at your phone going, well, I sent John a text. When are you going to respond? Or an email. You know what I'm guilty of? I'll write an email. I'll send an email. I'll wait a bit. I don't get a response. I'll pick up the phone and call the person and say, hey, did you not know I sent you an email? Or if you're with some, you don't have an answer or something and someone says, well, just Google it. So you get out and you, you dial it up because you've got to have the answer right now. As wonderful as technology is, what it teaches us is to not be mature. Because we don't learn to wait. And you cannot be spiritually mature or any levels of maturity if you do not learn to wait. So fasting. Maybe the discipline in our society that is needed most, but the one that is seldom practiced. You can't say yes to everything. You do not have that ability, that energy, or that power. So at some point, we're going to have to learn to say no. Self-denial teaches us to say no. Again, the assumption is not if you will do this. The assumption is when you do it, because what's of utmost importance is what is the motive behind it? Is it for applause? Recognition? What's the goal of your practiced piety? Is it to create something just for you and for God so your nature becomes more in line with the nature of Christ where the audience is one? Instead of us being on a stage where the audience is everybody else around us and we perform spiritually, religiously, so that we can get a reward right then. When I was, uh, when my children were younger, like three, four, or five years old, we used to have this nightly ritual. As soon as I would arrive home from work and and, and lay my stuff down normally on the table, immediately they wanted to play hide-and-seek. You might still play hide-and-seek with some of your children, maybe your grandchildren. And so I would come in, and I would cover my eyes, and I would count to 20. That was pretty good effects right there. I didn't work on that, but I, you know, 
uh, let me try that again, you know. So uh, I, would, I would cover my eyes, I'd count to 20, and, and then I would say that those magic words of ready or not, here I come. As soon as I finished that statement, I would hear giggles. I would hear, we're not in the closet. We're not under your bed. Daddy, if you come and look behind the sofa, you will not see us. They really wanted to be found. The object of the game for them was being found. The phrase that shows up over and over in the text, beware of how you practice your piety like the hypocrites. They want to stay in the dark. They want to be hidden. It's an audience of one. Why do you do what you do? Is it for recognition? Is it for a tax break? For people to, to say, look at that boy. Look at that girl. Look at that man. Look at that woman. They're, they're, they're so spiritual. Or is it just because you really want to please God? And in pleasing God, you become more like the nature of Christ. That's the lesson today. I invite you at this time, if you would, to bow your heads with me. Let us prepare our hearts to receive the gift of God's grace and mercy in Holy Communion. Oh God, what we do this morning is what we do as a part of our life, a part of our tradition. We acknowledge that before we receive this gift, uh, we confess. Not that it's a prerequisite for grace, it's because we need to. And so we acknowledge things about what we think, about what we say, what we do, whether it be in the past, maybe even at this very moment, and even what will be in the future. We're all in need of your grace. At the same time, in a few moments, God, when we have an opportunity to come to your table and we hold these symbols of bread and cup, and they're mindful of your son, his life, his death, his resurrection, his ascension, and the promise of his return. For us to hold that, God, we have to learn to wait. So even use this gift of communion as a means to help us to grow in our faith. And we pray this in your name. Amen. We serve what is called an open communion, which means that you do not have to be a member of this particular congregation to receive uh, these gifts of bread and cup. Uh, you can come with a thankful heart. That's all that is required. In a few moments, the ushers will cue your row. If you would, exit your row closest to the windows and then come down. You can stand and kneel at the altar. You'll be given a piece of bread and then you'll have an opportunity to take a cup. Go ahead and eat the bread and drink the cup and then drink, from, drink the juice in the cup. Uh, and there'll be a dismissal prayer for the entire table.
If you'd like to leave any types of gifts of benevolences, there are urns set up on both sides to receive those. Those go to help those in our community in need. for your gift of grace and mercy we give thanks and we pray this in the name of Christ Amen grace and mercy in your son Jesus Christ we give thanks O God may your name be glorified we pray amen and mercy in your son Jesus Christ we are grateful may your name be glorified forever we pray amen
Oh God, for these gifts and so much more that you give abundantly to us. For that we are grateful and we pray for your name to be glorified forever. Amen. God, it is in humility that we receive these gifts, and we pray, Lord, for your name to be glorified forever. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. God, for these gifts of grace, mercy, these gifts of salvation, we give thanks and we praise your name in the name of Christ. Amen. God, as we hold the gift of bread and cup, we're mindful of your sacrificial love for us. Uh, for all of this, we give thanks in your name. Amen.
those gifts of your son. We give thanks and we pray in the name of Christ. Amen. gifts of grace, mercy, and salvation. We are grateful. We pray, Lord, for your name to be glorified forever. Amen. God, it is in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit that we receive these gifts of salvation, grace, and mercy through your Son. We pray in your name. Amen. Amen.